Thank you for joining us for our Supercharged September video series. My name is Lisa Drake, and I'm the Assistant Director of Fleet Electrification at Merchants Fleet. And today I'm charged up to be talking to Auden Schindler, Senior Vice President of Sustainability for Aspen One, who is the parent company for Aspen Ski Company, Aspen Hospitality, and Aspen X. Auden is also an accomplished environmentalist and author of Getting Green Done and his newest title, Terrible Beauty, a unique roadmap for corporate environmentalism. So welcome to our Supercharge series, Auden, and can you introduce yourself? Hey, good to be here. Yeah, um, you know, I'm uh, the sustainability guy for this retail, outdoor, hospitality um, brand and uh, it, you know, we're different from traditional sustainability divisions in that we ask the question, if you actually cared about climate change, what would you do? And the answer to that is not what you're seeing from corporate America. All right, well, we'll dig into, into that a lot more. I'm gonna start with stepping back for a minute. In 2009, you released your first book, which is um, Getting Green Done, which I have right Yay. here. And uh, I have to say, I did read this back in 2009 or so. Um, you know, earlier days of corporate sustainability work, and this was really great storytelling about rolling up your sleeves and getting sustainability work done and really telling like, what's it like to get in the trenches and do sustainability work. And I have to say, I, I lent my copy, my 2009 copy to a colleague recently. And a couple months later, they returned a brand new copy to me and they said, I marked up your copy so much, I didn't feel like it was right to give it back to you in that way so i got a brand new clean copy <laughs> well, when i banked the three cents that i made from that sale <laughs> yes well point being that there's some some wisdom in in the book that's that holds its value uh many years later here but, oh, good. Uh, so now uh you're you've written another book and i'm looking forward to to, to getting a copy um terrible beauty and so I'm, Wondering what inspired the title and Terrible Beauty and how does it reflect the core message of the book? Yeah, so Getting Green Done was a, about the incredible difficulty of doing all the things that um, that I was told as I kind of came up in the sustainability field would be profitable and good for the environment and relatively straightforward. And the point was, boy, if it's this hard to do basic stuff like changing light bulbs, how are we going to solve climate change? And Terrible Beauty is basically 15 years out from that book. And it, it looks at the world and says, environmentalism, corporate sustainability, it hasn't worked. Uh, CO2 emissions keep climbing, global temperature keeps warming. Uh, what happened? And the short story is that the, the environmental movement is effectively complicit with the status quo. If you look at the kinds of small ball, generally free market, non-disruptive actions that people are you know, seeing as best practice, this is pervasive in, in the corporate world. These are not climate solutions and they ensure that change doesn't happen. So the title, the book is part memoir, it's part polemic, it's part critique, and it's part solution. But the title is about this gap between what we say we care about as citizens and parents. Um, you know, you ask, ask an American, what do you care about? I love my family, my community, my faith. Um, well, what are you doing in response to a threat to all of those things, climate change? And the answer is nothing. I might not even vote or I'll recycle plastic, which doesn't get recycled. So terrible beauty is this, it is talking about the, the gap and the sense of, so think about watching your kids play in the park when they're little. That's beautiful, it's soul filling. And there's also some terror to that because they're growing up in a world where the climate is going to be irreparably changed. And my thesis is maybe that 
love, the things we care about as citizens and parents and humans, maybe that can be the thing that drives us to actually act on climate change in a meaningful and scale way. Can you tell us a little more, maybe a pivotal moment from the book or a story from the book that will help us take that a little, another level deeper? Yeah, you know, the book opens. So, so one thing to know about the book, and if you've seen the cover, which is this beautiful, colorful picture of the world, but the world looks a little damaged, but it's also beautiful. That sums up the book, which is that this is a fun story about life and parenthood and human experience. And it's not, you know, if, if you said to me, if Lisa, you said to me, hey, Auden, I've got a climate book for you to read. I'd be like, I don't want to read a climate book. They're boring. I've read them all. So this is this is a book about climate change and business and environmentalism for people who hate those books. So it opens with um, me and a couple of friends in the Utah desert. And we're driving out from a trip we had done and we see a dust devil. And the dust devil starts to get closer and closer to the road. And we say, we could actually chase that thing and get inside it. So we chase it and it comes closer to us and they open the door and I run out and I plug my nose and eyes because it's a dust devil and I run into the center of the dust devil. And that story is about, well, it's, it's weird, it's goofy, it's fun, but why? Um, Matt, my friend took a video of it and he said he, took, he showed it to everyone he saw for the next month. Again, why? Well, what that is, it's an expression of human joy, raw joy and happiness, unencumbered by fears and financial concerns and climate change and so forth. And that's the kind of thing that we aspire to as human beings, which is we want everyone to have access to that kind of unmitigated joy. And the only way that, to do that for everyone to access those things is to solve climate change and create a stable society. So the book is about those, those basic human um, desires that can, and, and needs that can be realized and that can also be used to motivate a fix on climate. So given that, what do you hope your readers will take away from terrible beauty that will that will inspire them to take action? Or what actions are you asking them to take? Yeah, I, I want readers to say what we say, which is if I, whoever I am, a teacher, a corporate leader, a politician, if I actually cared about climate change, what would I do that would actually make a difference? And that what I'm frustrated by is that American citizens and also corporate sustainability leaders you know, you have this conversation, let's say with a CEO of a corporation, and this is most corporations. Hey, so you care about climate change, right? Oh yes, it's part of our, our guiding principles as a company. Um, uh, okay, so what are you doing about it? Well, we're measuring our carbon footprint, um, we're setting targets, we're doing reporting, um, and we have third-party certifications, and we're, we're gonna reduce our emissions 20% by 2030 or 30% or whatever. And then you say, that's awesome. Are those actions something that will solve climate change? The answer is, of course not, because it's all voluntary. It's only you and you're only cutting 50%. So you've now had a conversation with a CEO that says they care about climate change. They have a climate program that will not solve climate change. And this is true of American environmentalism too. So what I want people to say is, okay, well, what would drive change? And it's not that complicated in, in human history to look at how big change happens in society. It's called social movements and revolution. And on one hand, it's like, well, how do I, how do I get involved in a social movement? It is a little complicated. But on the other hand, if there's one thing that humans do and have a really good track record of, it's driving large change through social movements and revolution. 
So we should be asking ourselves, what is our greatest power to drive change? And if you're a citizen, the answer is different. If you're a corporation, and, and many of the stories in my book are from the corporate perspective, the answer is different from the thing you are being told. So 99 to 100% of corporate sustainability officers say, here's what I'm gonna do, carbon footprinting, tracking, emissions targets, uh, third-party certification, and reporting, and that's what we do. Those are not the answers. Those are complicity with a fossil fuel status quo. If the fossil fuel industry could have created a sustainability program that would not get in their way, and that would be universally applied across corporations, it would look like existing ESG CSR. I'm saying you got to think differently. Well, thinking differently is something that you definitely do at Aspen. You've been leading the sustainability work there for a long time. So, you know, in addition to some of the things people might expect to hear you talk about, like LED lights, I know you've done some more unusual or less predictable things. So could you tell us, pick one, tell us about it? Yeah, I mean, one example would be typically a corporation might say, okay, if we cared about climate, we'd intervene on climate policy and use our voice. So it might be, say, in a, in a state like Colorado, it might be a letter to a, a regulatory group or a letter to the editor. That's better than 99% of corporations. Corporations aren't doing that kind of advocacy. So we do that, but that's not enough. We got a call five years ago now from the governor saying, I want to appoint Auden to the Air Quality Control Commission. This is the regulatory body in the state that makes climate policy and makes energy policy. And my company said, okay, you're going to serve on this commission. You're going to be on the clock in your job and you're going to be making climate policy. So what corporation, I mean, Corporations have done this negatively, right? They've negatively influenced climate policy. That's why we are where we are. But who's been involved in, you know, what we did, which was we passed in my tenure, uh, the most strict methane regulations in the United States. We passed uh, low emission vehicle standards and um, zero emission vehicle standards, first central US state to do that. And we passed uh, strict regulations on hydrofluorocarbons. That's weird. You know, what what kind of corporation is actually putting a sustainability staffer on a regulatory body? So that's one example. And as we proceed here, I'm going to talk to you about some other examples. All right. Well, well, that's great. Um, you know, I know I, I do know that you've been very active in, in policy um, and public discourse about climate change. One of the ways you do that is with protect our winters. And maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that too. Yeah, I mean, protect our winters is a, is a long story, but the simple way to understand it is to say, look at the NRA. The NRA had, at its peak, it had 5 million people, maybe 3 million active members. And with that small, but very, very activated constituency, they not only owned their issue in Washington, but they won it forever. You could argue with, with gun issues, you're not gonna you know, get past what they've done uh, at the Supreme Court. They've locked it in. So they won, you could argue. Well, how come the outdoor industry, which is a 40 to 100 million people, Think about it, REI, the retailer, has some 23 million members. Um, how come they wield no political power in Washington? And when they do, and they barely do, it's on public lands, which are completely threatened by climate change. So what if this constituency, which many of them care about climate and the rest of them should care about climate, what if they were mobilized? What if they were weaponized? And what's interesting about that concept is that this outdoor community is very active, particularly in swing states. So think about Michigan, Pennsylvania. These are full of hunters and fishers and skiers. And so in practice, what Protect Our Winners can do 
is it can take this, this outdoor industry constituency that isn't inclined to be very politically active. Think about it. If you're a climber or a hiker, um, you didn't get into it to be in the political system. You were escaping the political system. So what if you could mobilize them? And we have some case studies where that worked. So 2018 in Montana, John Tester, who's a wonderful climate hawk, was in a very close election. And we got Conrad Anker and Hillary Hutchinson, who's a, a, a fisher, um, to go to Bozeman and West Glacier and Missoula and colleges and climbing walls and mobilize people. Tester won that election by 18,000 votes. You know, did Powell win that election for, for Tester? No, but that's how you should be thinking about social movements and the role of the outdoor industry. So thanks for sharing that. I'm wondering if you, looking back at your work at Aspen and all the very things you've done, what, what are you most proud of? You know, so I started my work and, and this was like getting green done starts with this story where I'm changing light bulbs, which is the easiest thing you can possibly do in sustainability. The returns are 50 to 100 percent. And it was hard. I couldn't get them done. Uh, there was other priorities. I couldn't get the budget. They didn't believe the energy savings would be there. So I said so I I proceeded with that. And we then we achieved that and got a lot done and our carbon footprint kept going up. And I was like, I'm doing everything I was supposed to do and our carbon footprint keeps going up. What's going on? Well, it turned out that our electric utility had increased the, the carbon intensity of its power by doubling down on coal. So I had this epiphany, which was, this isn't about us. This is about the utility. We need to figure out how to change the utility. And this is this story is in, in my new book, but to make a very long story short, we became activists and community organizers. And we changed the board of this utility over 15 years, working with partners in the community. And that utility went from 6% renewable power and primarily coal to, I think in the next few months, they're gonna hit 80% legitimate not paper renewable energy their ceo is a climate scientist i mean it and this is a utility that covers fifty thousand people including vale and that's what i am talking about which is this is the systemic change that needs to happen versus a corporation today would simply change its light bulbs cut its emissions and say we won look how green we are well, you had this opportunity, you have these opportunities to move society and we should be doing that. That's that's incredible impact. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, you know, it makes me think about, you know, where did this drive come from for you? What was the inspiration or turning point in your life that led you to become an environmentalist or maybe an activist or both? Yeah, so the, the key thing you need to know is I'm from New Jersey. And I was born in 1970. And I grew up in really a environmental hellscape. It was, it was also kind of an economic you know, disaster. Interest rates were incredibly high. We're still in Vietnam. Um, it was not, this was not a good time in America. And I grew up thinking, I hate New Jersey. And as I got older, I was like, you know, it's not that I hated New Jersey. It's that I hated America before environmental legislation. All the big laws, some of the most important environmental laws in the world, the history of the world, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, all came out around 1970. 1973 was the Endangered Species Act. And so I was in this world where the Meadowlands were full of trash, rivers were catching fire. You couldn't see New York City because of the smog. And in the next decade and next 20 years, those laws cleaned up the American environment. And so this was a profound time to be alive. And, and what I realized, my epiphany really occurred when I left New Jersey as a kid and would visit my um, grandparents in North Dakota. And I was like, what is this? 
how can how can everyone have this? How can I dedicate my life to fighting for these things uh, to prevent New Jersey in the 70s from happening? Um, and so the 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 knowledge I have today is that the way we solve these big problems was through big systemic legislation. And that, in some ways, that door has mostly been closed. We did pass the Inflation Reduction Act, but that's not the same kind of regulatory law as the Clean Air Act. So the opportunity is to think big um, and to recognize, you know, the massive benefits of those laws that we passed in the 70s. Yeah, that's a great point. So kids growing up in New Jersey, just as an example today, I mean, yes, those those laws 50 years ago now really benefited in New Jersey and all across the United States, better place in terms of cleaner air and cleaner water. And yet we have this climate crisis. So today, kids growing up are, you know, asking what are we doing about climate and why are we in this position and how are we going to get out of it? What Do you have advice for young environmentalists or young climate activists that are just starting out on this journey? Yeah, I mean, my, my primary advice is don't buy the conventional wisdom. You know, I get a lot of grad students and undergrad students who are going into the corporate world. And I say, if you get put in a room and your job is measuring carbon footprint, and then turning little dials within the corporation to reduce that. Don't think you're solving climate change. That's all good work, but you have to have an and there. And that is, hey, hey boss, I know we're doing this, but it's not really gonna solve the problem. What are we doing on policy? How are we engaging in, in state and federal issues? What about the movement? How do we engage customers? Think big. And I, I'm, I've been concerned that environmentalists, young people who get into that world, they just accept conventional wisdom. And we've, we've proven conventional wisdom in sustainable business and in environmentalism in the last 30 years has done almost nothing on the climate crisis. So my advice is do not accept that what you're being told is the right path. It was good to question. So how do you see things evolving from here in terms of the environmental movement and the climate crisis? Like looking out over the next decade, what do you see happening and, and what role do you hope to play? Well, I, I think that, you know, on one hand, things aren't that great. If you look at the numbers on climate, we're trending warmer and warmer and we're seeing more natural disasters and so forth. At the same time, I do feel like there's a, a level of a, a civics revolution in the United States. Uh, the next presidential election will determine a lot, but I think we have an electorate that's starting to care uh, about citizenship and doing meaningful things. So I think there could be leadership from the United States um, in going after these problems in big ways. I think there's beginning also to be a crisis of neoliberalism, which is the essentially faith in free markets. There was an interesting piece in the New York Times on this topic. I think people are starting to say, you know, this kind of governance hasn't worked for the majority of people and it's not getting better. So um, I see my role, you know, my role as, as a, you get middle-aged as, as we are, you, you start to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. I'm not a good kind of corporate guy. I'm an agitator, I'm a gadfly, I'm a writer and communicator. So I think my job is to push the movement and, and to try to, you know, get business, but also the environmental community to be a lot more thoughtful and aggressive in how it drives change. I do think I am in the business world and I do think business has a role I just think it hasn't, with the exception of two or three corporations, it hasn't used its power um, to drive the kind of big scale change it could. But I, I think we can't throw that tool out. You know, we can't just say, ah, business, it's not capable of doing this kind of thing.
Well, thank you. That gives us a lot of things to think about and uh, means for action. I can't wait to to read Terrible Beauty. And um, thank you for talking with me today. Sure. Good to see you, Lisa. Thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch.